when I thought everything was completely hopeless and that I was going to end my life there in the plantation in Samoa, I took myself there and I thought, yep, this is a good place to do it, end, end it all here. And I looked up around me just in that moment. I just wanted to take one more look around me. And I just saw, and it felt like everything was in slow motion. I saw my parents' plantation. I saw the cocoa trees around me. And um, I saw just beautiful golden cocoa pods and the leaves kind of like flickering. And, and I felt just kind of this warmth um, sort of wrap around me um, from, from these, my surrounding. The, plantation itself was kind of coming alive. The culmination of all the love that ever existed in my life kind of settled on me on that day and told me, this is not your end, this is your beginning. <laughs> Welcome to Hear Us Now, Our Truth, Our Stories. Hear Us Now is a podcast about family violence survivors. While it takes a village to raise a child, it also takes a village to kill one through neglect. The time is over for hiding our pain. Instead, it's time to share our stories, to speak up, to seek help. It's time to turn bystanders into heroes and equip them to bring healing and change for the next generation. This is Hear Us Now. Welcome to the Hear Us Now podcast. My name is Marie Young, your host, and my special guest is Floris New. She's the owner of Ms. Sunshine Organic Farms in Tuanai Samoa. She's the co-founder of SWAG, Samoa Women's Association of Growers. She's an organic koko farmer, a cacao ambassador, a proud mum to Mary New. She's visionary, entrepreneurial, and she's a feminist. And she's here to fearlessly share her truth, her story. Malo Sofu and welcome, Floris. Well, thank you very much again, uh, Marie, for the opportunity to come and share with you um, a little bit of my journey um, as a Samoan or Indigenous woman. Um, Floris New is a 46-year-old mother. Um, I see my role as a mother first and then as a farmer second. Um, I'm a cocoa grower or farmer from Samoa and what's really different about what I do is that I grow organically um, and that's uh, purely because of my desire to um, help uh, lessen the impact um, on the planet in terms of you know the damage that um, you know us humans um, have had that uh, impact for many many years on our planet and it's uh, something really important and close to my heart um, but also another thing that's important to me um, as a, a woman farmer is that I look to the example of, of, of our ancestors um, as our um, uh, indigenous growers or farmers from, from our um, uh, heritage um, as Samoans, um, the way that we do traditional farming, I am very passionate about carrying that on into the future and I really feel like that's going to be part of the solution for, you know, um, kind of healing our planet and our people and, and of course um, uh, it's something that makes me really happy. So um, yeah, that's who I am, I guess, in a nutshell for now. That's great. And I know, I know you've, as I mentioned, you, you wear different hats and many hats, but yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. I guess at, currently I am someone that is really exploring aspects of my timeline or my life and taking pockets of those and turning it into something like this podcast. So I've been on the journey of healing from domestic violence, which is the reason why I thought we'll start this um, it's nothing new under the sun, but I do believe that it's we need to improve certain things that is under the sun, and so um, and also using my story and my experience of how to overcome and and not be stuck in domestic violence. So 
uh, that is one of the reasons why I've started this this series, this podcast. I'm also studying at the moment, but I'm part of a a bigger community, and I am I'm a daughter. I'm I'm, I'm married. I turned forty nine on the eighteenth of September. So what, two days ago? So we're both in our forties towards the later. So hanging on to that forty nine. <laughs> Before you get, before we join the five O club, um, and I truly believe that you know um, the best years starts in your forties. You know, there's a little bit more healing and perspective and hindsight, and and so yeah, that's a little bit about me. So the next question is, what do you do for a living? And I guess you've sort of mentioned that as well, but you feel free to elaborate. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess. Just as, um, you know, me becoming part of this podcast as well, I'm really, you know, happy to kind of share um, my journey, which has been um, quite a long one. Uh, even though I'm only 46, um, I, it still makes me feel like I've been on this really long train <laughs> to where I am now. Um, and as, a, you know, for a living, um, what I do, as I said before, is I'm a cocoa farmer. But I wasn't always that. Um, I was a corporate um, uh, professional, um, I, if, if you could put it that way. Um, I worked in um, many companies, different kinds of businesses. I even had my own business um, previously. And um, the journey that I've had through um, family violence or domestic violence has kind of uh, really um, brought me to where I am today and I guess that's I, one of the reasons why we're we're talking about this in the in the podcast is because we've had so many um, you know different kind of journeys within the journey that we've had to get to the place of, of healing and the place that we're in that we can speak about um, family violence today so um, simply put you know I'm a cocoa grower and um, bringing also like yourself um, communities together through the work that we do so not just as a, a businesswoman or entrepreneur but um, I also run my organization as a, as a charitable trust which means that I support other women growers and farmers um, in my community in Samoa so hence the reason why I work um, with these other NGOs um, or organizations that involve women around the world. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit more of an extension of what I do. That's great. Thank you. So what do you do for a living? Uh, one is I'm a new podcaster. <clears throat> I, I sort of dabbled in podcasting a couple of years ago before the name wasn't trendy. Um, I love to talk. I love people. Um, a lot of the work that I do at the moment is a lot of community consultation. I'm an entrepreneur. So just like yourself, we're very, we're very like-minded in many ways. Um, I run a company called Pacific Enterprise People, and it's mainly a lot of it's to do with social enterprise. It's again, very similar to your vein of uh, encouraging women. Uh, for me, it's really about, my passion is really to help normalize prosperity through our community, through being informed through education, through sharing, um, and a lot of things like that. And an extension of that is really is where I get to really tap into people like yourself that are um, being able to sort of take an opportunity or take a, a particular phase of your life and being able to use it for such a powerful way that you are turning what could have been, and I'm sure that you'll touch on this a little bit later, um, a phase of your life where you went back to your ancestral land and and you find that you know sometimes our thoughts is not what God thinks, and so yeah, that's what I do for a living. Is I I hope to um, elevate and celebrate other women or other um, other caregivers, um, regardless of their religion or background, about bringing awareness of family violence or domestic violence, so that we don't sweep this topic under the carpet anymore so that we're able to learn from how we've all healed and it's a continuous journey for me. Um, and so that's just, again, as an extension of, I call it a ministry, other people call it a calling. Um, it could be a passion, but something that, you know, really resonates with you no matter how 
challenging and how hard it could be, or, or at times is, but it, it tends to drive you to, you know, to encourage you to do what it is that that you're doing, which is why I love what you're doing and it's why we're here. So that's um, what do you do for a living? And so the next question is, when did you realize family violence was happening to you? Yeah, well, that's a really, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I guess if you think about it, I think um, the realization of, of that it actually is happening, truly happening to you, um, doesn't come until much, much later. And uh, when somebody kind of prompts you or if something really um, prominent happens that kind of shocks you into the into the fact that the reality that that someone is not treating you um, and I see domestic violence or family violence as um, as a behavior as as a way that somebody is treating you that isn't right and I first um, you know, discovered that or came to realize that um, one of my um, trips around the country in Samoa, around the island um, with my ex-partner, I've been married for, I had been married for seven years, um, but at that time we hadn't been married yet. Um, we're just very new um, couple and we'd only been together a couple of months and we took a trip around the island um, and we were driving uh, by some really beautiful spots and a really good day had just kind of turned into a very dark and dreary kind of day because of what happened um, and it was wasn't a you know kind of it was really unexpected um, uh, we saw um, he went outside to take a photo um, of the beautiful scenery and um, I just waited back in the car and um, a young boy had uh, you know kind of accosted him and and said to him um, that he needed to pay for the, the photograph um, that he had taken out there and so I could sort of hear what was going on from across the road and um, I just saw that he was getting very, very angry and um, quite aggressive towards the little boy. He couldn't have been more than 12 years old. And um, the experience with me was the fact that he turned, you know, he turned that um, mood and, and, you know, completely changed. Uh, his aggression was, cha was di uh, diverted to me. Um, when I had intervened and, and asked if everything was okay and tried to explain to the young Samoan boy in, in our language, um, you know, that we were just taking a photo and that, um, but he had gotten, he had, it had escalated so quickly and he had gotten so angry um, and started swearing and carrying on and, and basically lashing out at me at that stage and I I think it was the first time that I felt afraid of of somebody that and it wasn't you know you get afraid when you meet strangers or um, you know if you're in a situation that you're not quite sure of but this is a person that you know that you think you know really well and that you've known had this you know different vision of them and then suddenly that person kind of and I think what it is, the first time I realized it, is the feeling that I got, the nerve, the nervousness um, and the fearfulness that I felt um, from that altercation during that day because it carried on um, after we got into the car. It just continued to carry on um, for another couple of hours down the road and it escalated to me having to try to get out of the car and then walking maybe 300 meters and him chasing me with the car and and it just kind of escalated and, and it just got to a point where I was um, fearful for my life I mean uh, really you know that that feeling when you get when you're like turning around to see if anyone's watching to see if anyone can see um, the stress that you're under and the stress that you're going through 
and um, just feelings of wanting to escape. And I think that was the very first time that I just wanted to escape this person. Like I, I don't want to be with you because of the way that you're treating me right now. And I hadn't felt that feeling ever before in my life. Um, yeah. I think that was the first time that I had experienced family violence and it's something that kind of carried on um, and became almost became normal in my marriage until I decided to end it um, yeah and ran away so <laughs> um, that was my experience what about you Marie <laughs> yeah um, yeah that's very insightful what you said and that was really earlier on too in the relationship wasn't it that was before you got yeah. married. It was about a month yeah. before we got married, yeah. I realized family violence was happening to me, and I think for me it would be a different perspective because I wasn't married. I was only four years old. <laughs> so, um, And so I, my perspective really is from a child's perspective, you know, and seeing your parents. It's only now when I'm – which is one of the reasons why I'm starting to, to explore – talking about it, having this type of talanoa, is that I, I can be at that space where I'm not triggered every five minutes talking about domestic violence because it wasn't always the case. You know, it was very, very difficult. And and um, But I think I, I knew family violence was happening to me when, well, first of all, as a four-year-old or as a child, um, you have no control at all. You're at the mercy of your caregivers and your parents. Um, and so I, I love my parents. I know that they had the greatest intention and they were not, most parents do not want to harm their parents, but I know that over the years when I spoke to my parents is that, um, being the migrants for the first time coming to New Zealand, you know, um, and they were trying to, trying to get used to the, the country, the language, the finances and not being a, a, around their, their community and their ainga. So I can understand that now, but as a four-year-old in a, in a, in a growing up and seeing what it was like, I mean, my first experience was really um, seeing my, my mum sort of um, was, she was hit by my dad and I don't understand as a four-year-old. So all I remember was that I ran to the next door and knocked on the door. I don't even know how I knew that and to see if she can come and help. Um, and I can talk about it now because myself and, and my mum and my dad and my, we, we've all had to go through this healing. Um, but that was the first time that I realised that, oh, okay, this family violence is happening to me. And But the long story short, because I know that we've only got six minutes, this is our first series, <laughs> um, is that... Uh, I started to um, try to understand. I, I was very much in a in a in a disarray. So my environment was very. There was no structure, and I think, as you know, as a mum, Floris, that I'm sure that you know your daughter, as a mum, you, you, kids need structure. They need to know. Okay, we're going here, or you're going to school, or you're going to do your homework, and that was completely not my my experience because. The family violence was happening around, and so therefore it was a lot of anxiety. Um, I just I wasn't paying attention at school. How can you? Because you don't know where, whether we're going to be inside the house or cops are going to be over, you know, all that type of thing. And so I think that would be how I realised that our family was not like the other families at church. We were. Um, sort of different on weekends when we go to church on Sunday and we were very different during the week. We would have cops over during the week and we were like the Monswell Warrior family and then Sundays we're on in our white Sunday best and got the kuspa'ia and wearing our hats and then we're pretending that everything's fine. And so um, over time I, I, I felt quite angry I was very angry because I, I really liked school and I wanted to read my books and I wanted to excel in, in my education, but I, I just, it was just, I couldn't because I, I didn't have that um, normality perhaps, you know, the routine or 
um, because my parents also worked very long hours. So that's how I realized that family violence was happening to me. Um, so the next question, looking back now, what were the early signs that you missed? Um, I think just to quickly go back to, to your experience as a child experiencing family violence, I think that whenever you talk about that, I think I, I always, it always reminds me of how I felt as a parent having my daughter kind of experience family violence you know, after she was born because, you know, um, it took us a while to, to have children. But, you know, when we, when we did um, start and, and my daughter was born, in fact, I had been experiencing this physical and psychological emotional abuse right throughout my pregnancy, prior to my pregnancy, right throughout my pregnancy, and even after um, I had given birth to my daughter. And, and then my daughter was exposed to it, you know, um, in her very early years. Um, and I think now when I hear you, I remember her being in my arms when I'm trying to fend off, you know, um, being hit or strangled or bitten or something, you know, um, from my ex-partner and, 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 and being fearful. Um, no longer for myself but fearful for my my child because i had to protect her i had not only myself but her to be responsible for and i think earlier on that's the time you know those times when i was watching my daughter going through that i was planning inside my head how i was going to to escape and take her away from that pain and i think in that time because it was such a traumatic kind of few years and it, you know it happened um, you know when my daughter was I think the worst our worst year was the year that my daughter was actually born right up until her entire 12 months first 12 months of life and then by the time she was one and a half I had left you know I had it had it fortunately escaped um, with her but the abuse didn't stop there the abuse continued even though I was no longer with him so what happens is like people might think in their minds that just because you leave physically being in a different place even in a different country because when I left I left the country I left you know the country completely at the at the risk of of being prosecuted for that because you know, I had taken her away and I was being accused of kidnapping. But, you know, then you have all of those other things that come afterwards that you have to deal with. And it's a very stressful time. Um, and I think, um, so when you asked me the question, Marie, um, the, the, the last question, um, if you can remind me again. What were the early signs that you missed? I think just the changing mood. I think when you're dealing with someone who has an addiction, um, you know, you when you meet them for the first time and you meet them out in social situations, you don't actually know that they have a problem with, you know, substance or um, that sort of thing because you think that they're that you know you're all doing that in that social situation. It's like a kind of uh, considered as normal you know, to be drinking in a social situation and then to get drunk and then, you know, to be moody, to have your, um, you know, persona completely change. And I think that was the scariest thing in my situation was that one minute there was this really loving person that you're dealing with who completely, you know, indulged in the, you know, this beautiful uh, idyllic relationship and then suddenly when alcohol was was a, a factor it completely changed to the opposite almost like a Jekyll and Hyde um, personality changes and and that that is more subtle and and I think I didn't notice it for a, a while um, 
on my wedding night, I really realized that there was, that could be something, um, you know, wrong. I had probably brushed off that, that instance, the first instance where we'd gone around the island and I was shocked and I thought, oh my gosh, well, this is what relationships must be like, you know, because that was kind of a serious relationship then for me. Um, but, you know, there are things, um, personality, like I said, when there's a personality change, that person can be completely loving and, and be apologetic and and um, and try and do things to change your mind. Um, in in reality, it's called manipulation. <laughs> mm. um, I was, you know, completely under his um, manipulation and and emotional blackmail, emotional manipulation, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, I was caught up in that, and so much so that it changed me as a person, as a woman. Um, it, you know, I, I started to learn how to like kind of hide things away from friends or, you know, not, you know, tell the full story of things that were happening to me because I would get embarrassed. And that was purely because I was made to feel shameful and shamed about the things that were happening to me behind closed doors. And sometimes they weren't even happening behind closed doors. They were happening in front of people but those people kind of gaslighted and 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 encouraged that behavior from the other person from the abuser um and made you feel completely shame you know shameful of of um how you were reacting to it or not reacting to it um so the early signs you know definitely um maybe the first year and a half um, that I had known him, I'd kind of suspected that there was something wrong, that there, maybe he was drinking too much. But those were the signs, you know, because I don't, I, I've never been a drinker. Like I was a social, you know, drinker. But the more I saw him drinking, like every day, I just, I, you know, obviously in your head, you're thinking this is not normal. But when you try to tell people that there some, might be something wrong, everybody knows that that person, your partner, is a, has a certain personality. And the certain personality that they project out into the public is that, you know, they're a great family guy, you know, really happy, chatty, um, friendly, super friendly, and very helpful. So that persona is known you know and they make sure that that persona is very well known throughout your circles um and you know people would be surprised if i said oh you know he gets a bit moody and he gets a bit loud and he gets a bit you know he knocks things over and punches things and you know um swears at, you, at me and 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 says you know derogatory makes derogatory remarks and pretty much put me down and all of that kind of stuff so people just like oh you know guys you know when men get drunk and they have a little bit of a drink they get become a little bit elevated and um and so on so for many years for about two and a half years i was not convinced that they were right and I was wrong but you know you just carry on and you try your best because us women that's what we do we try to to smooth things over that's you know mm. we try to keep the peace and we try to mm. you know um, we don't want to lose anything we don't want to lose the relationship or the love and sometimes you just feel you're not worthy to have anything like this is my lot this is it for me um, like deal with it Kind of thing so yeah those were the early signs what about you yeah yeah you've touched on some really good points there um one is that you were saying that um sometimes these things take the persona um uh, takes its um you know how like you're saying it, it 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 presents itself but it actually then becomes a ongoing thing so whilst that's happening you're just trying to like you say, you just want, as a woman, you just want to do your best. You just want to 
And especially when you were saying that, I was thinking about how when we're married, obviously the way that we all brought up is that we want to we want our marriages to work, don't we? We want so we will try all sorts of ways to save. And so while the persona and while the behavior starts to develop and perhaps there were patterns there, but I'm just saying, and I'm not just thinking about what, what you're saying, but just for myself as well, um, because the question is that um, looking back now, what were the early signs that you missed? I think it's this, because my, my experience started very early, um, I mean, it's decades one of the things that, um, as a bystander, which is another th another thing that I'd love to your thoughts on, how important are people that know of uh, the the person that's doing this? But sometimes it could be close people, it could be family, it could be a, a community. But they may know or may know some signs, but but often sometimes they don't get involved or don't even bother to ask if. If are you okay? Um, and um, I'm wondering. I've just added another question, if that's okay. Before we before we go to the next question, <laughs> yeah. Because remember when I said about how we would from Monday to Monday to Friday, we were completely different. Look, look. We our family looked completely different when we went to the weekend, where we either got besties or practice at church and then Sunday everybody's in their Sunday best and the community is tight knit so somebody knows yeah somebody knows what's maybe happening but I'm wondering if I could ask you this extra question then we can come back to the next question then I can I'm just wondering about your thoughts on bystanders or people that you think why couldn't you help? Especially for me, from my perspective as a young person, I couldn't do anything. I'm too young. But we were going to a community that they know of, they know what's going on. But in my experience, nobody actually helped us. And back in the day, we didn't have all these resources. We didn't have counseling. We didn't have like, oh, just call this ministry. And that was another thing that really added to my anger as a kid growing up is like, where are the people where I, I was trying to put one, I was trying to put community and the church thing. And I was thinking, is, is anybody going to help us? Cause we're just, it's traumatic during the week. And then we have to wear our Sunday best and pretend that, hello, my Lord, good morning. Yeah, how important is the role of people that should people or friends to to help? Absolutely, so important. So it's the most frustrating thing um, when I think about your situation and I think about you know other people's situation. Like even now with the lockdown and all that, you know, with families that are kind of stuck at home and having to deal with this and not having any compute uh, any community or any kind of friends um, visible uh, if you like but in a normal situation and like in in your situation as a child um, kind of experiencing this helplessness and hopelessness because all of these people are just watching you going through this you know very real traumatic experience as a child as a family um, your mother as a wife um, and they're all just kind of sweeping it under the carpet and I think this is kind of a common thing in, in uh, Pacific communities and uh, families uh, Samoan families in particular it's no different in my situation um, I think it was the most frustrating thing for me um, was having um, family actually uh, completely 100% see what's going on but kind of in denial of you know how how this situation is playing out and wanting to smooth things over so that everybody is happy and you know we're all on this kind of level playing field um, and I think it's also shame it's shame because 
um, it's because some of them are experiencing it themselves and they don't want to kind of almost admit that that is the reality that they're living in and that is which is crazy because they should be sympathizing with with um, you know being compassionate and and um, sympathizing with with things that are terrible things that are happening to you and and trying to help to help themselves but they don't immediately think that they completely think that oh you know um, uh, what is it stay the status quo and you know just don't ap upset the apple cart and just you know s God will forgive and you need to forgive and let's just go to church and start a new you know turn over a new leaf and s and, and, and start a new day and that to me is really disgusting because that's exactly what happened when I was going through I remember one time when um, when my ex-partner threw a uh, container of like a steaming hot uh, container of takeaways at me um, while I was had my back turned and that and the police came and um, you know sure I had to call the police afterwards and my all of my neighbors all of my neighbors were there and they they were watching the way that he was and they're hearing the way that he was talking to me and doing all of this and then when when the police came they immediately wanted to smooth things over and just said oh no you know there was no evidence of any violence you know they were just having a kind of an argument and you know they were going back and forth at each other and um, and everyone just decided to ignore the fact that I had this container full wow. of curry that was steaming hot that was thrown at me while while I turned my back to walk up the steps you know and and and, and that itself that is an act of violence you know um, completely doing that is an act of violence but people just completely ignored it and and wanted to smooth it over just I think it's a societal thing I think it's just people they don't want to like you know make an issue like you know bring back up an issue and the one the one situation that I um, that I do regret as a bystander as a you know um, somebody who has advised having had the experience myself um, of being abused in this way I noticed it in a friend as well and I didn't just stand by and not do anything I tried to do many different things over a period of time but in the end I had written this big long letter um, email that I was going to send to my friend's family to kind of expose everything and all of that and just in the very last moment I don't know what it is that caused me to to do that to delete the message you know and and you know to this day I I think since what happened to her happened I got over obviously after some time that I had blamed myself on you know for not sending that letter but I think even if I had sent that letter I think it would still have been you know viewed in a certain way um, by you know those people because it would be showing up something was wrong in their you know in society something right. was wrong with that set up or that family or that yeah. you know that person's reputation or my even my reputation and and and, and all mm. of that and I think it's just this fear and this happens because we all have this common fear of interfering <laughs> of being you know of of being blamed I guess or taking of, of, you know being then having the blame turned on us because yeah and I I think it's a horrible thing I don't know what it is I don't know what the answer is but I think it's horrible that people let that happen and I think that's why it's so important today that we teach people to act and react you know when they see these certain signs and all these things that are going wrong in society that we need to kind of stand up and and and, and voice it you know um, 
And that has changed me. I mean, and not just because of my situation, but in many other situations that I that I've come across. So it's yeah, it's disappointing and frustrating to have your community and your family just not recognize that there's anything wrong. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm really, really glad that we're spending a little bit of time on, on this because it's, and it can be, it can save the, uh, the next generation potentially. It can save a life. It can save so much harm, uh, you know, to, to the whole, to all involved. Um, but I think that's why even, even for myself, I was thinking, Oh, do I really want to do a, a podcast like this? Because I, I've got to actually, I can't just interview someone like yourself and others. I've got to also have that ability, you know, we have to actually share the story. And so, you know, but that feeling, if you know, Floris, that feeling of, oh, like, like that letter you sent, or do I do it? Do I not? Do I put myself out there? Or, but yeah, we, we've come full circle, I believe. And, you know, we mention our ages we're not in our twenties anymore. Um, and you know, we've, we've lived life a little bit. And so the questions, when we say, um, things like, you know, looking back, what were the early signs? Um, and, and also to help those that maybe, uh, don't have, don't feel like they're worthy. They don't feel like there's sometimes women feel like, oh, this is my lot in life. I deserve this. Maybe it's my fault. And, um, but we, we're here to say, no, <laughs> it's not your fault. Um, whether it's a curry throwing at you, a hot takeaway or a verbal abuse or, uh, sexual abuse or physical abuse or financial abuse, they're all abuse. They all come under the, um, you know, the umbrella of family violence. Um, so our, our, our next question was, what was the most traumatic experience that you were not prepared for? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I, I wasn't prepared for any of it. <laughs> <laughs> there, I think I, I wasn't prepared, like, after what one of the altercations, um, the incidents that, that happened to me, I wasn't prepared for myself to go to feel so deeply um you know in in depression and hopelessness that i attempted to take my life like without even without without even blinking an eye or you know batting an eyelid or, or whatever without thinking whatsoever the only thing that came to mind was to end it because I can't live with this anymore, you know, I can't live with this relationship, this um, constant um, psychological abuse, um, the violence, the physical violence, um, the put downs, uh, basically the threats, you know, the threats that you'll never amount to anything good after, if you leave me, this is you know you're never going to amount to anything else like you there is you have no nothing to look forward to if you if you leave or if you leave i will take our child away or you know just the threats the blackmail the emotional blackmail um all of that you know and and then you know then to to feel so empowered that they can go and do whatever they like and behave in whatever way whether it's with you know cheating or with um you know um just taking a trip for six months and not seeing you and your child for six months you know it's like um all those kinds of things that kind of you think in your mind you know in your in your sane um mind that those things are not normal, you know, in a relationship, those are, that's not normal behavior. And, you know, you, I remember, and definitely I was not prepared for the feelings that I had, 
the in-depth feelings that I had of that darkness that me falling into that darkness that I just wanted to end my life because I could no longer I could no longer uh, bear to another day waking up and having to listen and having to feel the way that I did um, when I was with him um, or the feeling of wanting to literally escape every second that you're awake you're trying to plan your your escape from this from this hell that you you know you really believe that you're in and and every time that you do try to do something and it society either goes against you um, you know like if you're calling the police all the time they don't listen to you all they do is take you to a women's uh, refuge center overnight and then they bring you back and you're right back in there in that same nothing has been done to change the situation um, they get a slap on the wrist um, you know they have to go to some sort of uh, anger management program and that's apparently enough you know to f it's then like 24 hours later you're right back to the same argument and to the same BS that you had been experiencing and it just carries on and on and on and that's and that's also um, that's the the law there's something wrong there um, you know it's the system it's how you know how people how the society is driven by the system and society is in denial of you know what is painful and and what is abuse um, there are you know levels apparently um, and I think it's heartbreaking that when this thing hap when this abuse happens the children are the the ones are the biggest losers you know whether it's during the abuse or after the fact because you still have to deal with them you still have to go to court with them because they try to take away you know even though you escape with your life they're still going to try and take things away from you they're still going to try and control have that power and control over you so you're stuck no matter where you are and 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 i think at that time when i felt at my very lowest i tried to take control of it by ending it by completely ending my life i think if i end my life then my daughter at least would be free and he wouldn't you know he maybe he would be a different person and he'd be a better father or a, you know better whatever you know he would change maybe what i do is what will change him but that's not true <laughs> of course because it's not true because mm. there's almost like one thing is to go through it and then you you have when you come out of it it's all the it's all the trauma and how, how do you deal with, um, you know, being every day, like you say, being um, told that you're nothing, that, you know, you can't make it without me if you leave. You know, that, that sort of verbal put down and manipulation and this. And they say sometimes that part is worse than getting hit because at least you can recover for when you get hit. But I'm not saying that I'm not saying it, it's good to get hit, but the, 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 the verbal stuff, it, it, it can be can be twice as, as challenging. Um, what was the most traumatic experience that I wasn't prepared for? Well, um, just like you, it's like, well, where do we start? Um, I wasn't prepared for um, the knock-on effect, the domino effect that happens when you're not four years old anymore. I wasn't prepared for the fact that I, I, I couldn't relate to my peers I wasn't prepared for the fact that I, I had to become an adult um, very, very early on in life. So therefore, um, I didn't really have a childhood. I don't know what it's like to play. I don't know what it's like to have a, um, a, a stuffed toy or um, when, when I'm with other, you know, when I'm with other, I noticed that when I was with other children and they'll say, Mary, what's your toy? What's your favorite toy? Um, do you know, have you got that book on, you know, whatever the book is at the time? Um, and they're playing. I 
wasn't prepared for the fact that I could not relate to children because I wasn't a kid. I was already at four in a different environment. I couldn't relate to them. And I was always a little bit older. I was always um, much, they will say things like, oh, Marie has so much potential. If if only she would turn up to school because I was always absent or I was, and when I was at school, I, I just couldn't, it really affected my concentration. You know, it really affected, um, I'm really good in terms of emergencies. So if there's emergency, I know exactly what to do. It's because my life has been an emergency, you know, so... But if, if, if I've been told, if I'm told by a, a teacher to go, right, Marie, sit down and go to page seven, read page seven to page 25, and then I, I will struggle. Because, um, and that has sort of led me to reading about um, the attachment and developmental trauma, which is by, it's a study by Dr. Bruce Perry. And it's a book that him and Oprah Winfrey have just released. And this talks about, just what's happening in the body, in mum's body, when she's got baby inside and the baby is so warm and, and it's got all the things that the body needs, the baby needs from mum's nutrients. But when that baby comes out of her, it's very traumatic because it's like, oh, but it's not traumatic because mum's there, the caregiver's there to embrace the, the baby, stroke it and do all the, th all the things that we know a mother should do. But imagine if the mother's not able to do that. And so it starts from how early it is. It starts from before they even come out of the womb. And then you, and then when the, the kid is actually just trying to find its bearing and then you introduce to domestic violence straight away. I wasn't prepared for um, the fact that I, I couldn't really, um, like, I wasn't prepared for planning you know sometimes we're surviving so it's very difficult to plan or very difficult to have like um i'll hear friends at school they'll say oh you know after high school i'm gonna go to uni or after 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 this and and i want to be a vet well i want to be this thing the only thing that i was thinking about is i need to get a job um finish this school and i need to get a job and i just need to help my mum who's Who's who? She's holding down two jobs, low pay, um, barely any sleep, and so I help her when she's on night shift to prepare her clothes and iron and do. All. I did all that, so I I couldn't even relate to my my um, my peers. I wasn't prepared for the fact that by the by the time I'm in my twenties, how much the trauma has affected me, and I didn't realize that at that time until I'm much later on. I wasn't prepared for the fact that you actually need to need counselling. You need help to 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 walk through some of the some of the key things. You know, like anxiety. You know, there's all these different things that you feel because trauma affects you on a cellular level. It affects how your brain. You know, as a kid, you associate all these things with um, fear and. You know, and I also wasn't prepared for the fact that I, by the time I was um, a teenager, I, I did not like any adults. I just didn't trust them. I didn't trust a teacher. I didn't trust any authority. I, that was my worldview at the time, is that if, if the adults that were supposed to look after me couldn't do a good job, why would anyone else do a good job to me? And so I had to really overcome many 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 things and I'm, I'm so grateful to Jesus that I'm here because like like you um, Floris I thought the same thing I thought right I'm gonna go to the Moana and look at look as far away you know from where I want to get away from this um, environment I didn't even know what it was it was not living I wanted to get out I wanted to escape one of the things when when we were on our way to church and we were in our Sunday best and we were in the car was going really fast and there was an argument in the car, I basically opened the car and I said, if you, if you don't stop, I'm just going to jump. I would love to jump because by jumping like you to end it, I wouldn't have to actually go through this thing. 
I don't have to face the uncertainty and cops and um, it was it's very tiring. So um, those are just some of the things. Yeah, those are some just a few things that I just why I want to do this podcast, even if it's just for you and I. <laughs> so <laughs> because you we need to share it. You know, and I have not shared anything. You know, I haven't shared, and I've been one of those. I've been in that 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 um, cultural. I don't know if it's cultural. I don't even understand, but we tend to not want to. Um, be real with what's really happening behind closed doors. And I don't want to live, I don't want to, I don't want to contribute to that. I want to air it out and say, these are some of the signs. If you have a child coming in and they're angry, this is one of the things. If you have an angry child to any teacher in the school, or maybe they're a little bit rebellious, please don't write them off. Something big is going on at home. Don't just write them off. Is there something happening? Just be patient with them, and um, you know. But don't don't write them off because often the, a lot of the times these teachers will write me off. They'll say, "Oh, they'll stereotypically put me in a um, a statistic." You know, they'll think, "Oh, if if you come from that type of background, well, you you're going to be statistically you're going to be like this." You're you're not going to be anything. You're either going to be imprisoned. You're going to do drugs, kill yourself, or kill someone else. Um, yeah, it's like they've already preempted. They've they've already preempted that, and now that's that's what society and this, and then which becomes the system. You know, because the system reacts to society and and vice versa. But when you talk about um, the dressing, you know, how you, you dress up, your family is all dressed up in white and you go to church and, you know, everything is hunky-dory. And um, and that's that's pretty much what's happening psychologically, you know. That's, that's what, you know, um, the abused and the abuser is wanting to portray this, you know, this perfect, um, clean and um, pure kind of um, facade that we paint because society forces us also to do that and you know society the way that we're conditioned um, through our community and our cultures and that I mean I really feel like part of our Samoan culture is about that it's about saving face not just in our own culture but in many other cultures around the world it's all about saving face like we have to show our best, you know, we have to have this clean purity and um, whatever to show everybody that everything is okay on the outside. But when really there's a deep, dark and murky water, you know, um, swirling around inside of, uh, of these young children, this, this abused mother or abused father. And, and so on and I think I think it's disgusting it's something that we have to change as a society um, and instead of the law and the lawmakers and the systems actually punishing us for you know for the um, I guess kind of our reaction to that um, it should be trying to offer solutions as to how we can deal with it you know just like many things it's it's always, society always puts a band-aid over everything instead of actually, um, you know, um, addressing um, the real issue. And I think that's what we do in our communities, is what we do in our families. It's also what people do that are closest to us, like our best friends or our friends or our neighbours, um, sisters and brothers and so on, close relatives. They just hang by and they just want to have this smooth over everything and to a certain degree which is really dangerous and really sad even more so is that we begin to do that ourselves we do it to ourselves we we do this whole you know let's just gloss over let's put on our rose-colored glasses and pretend that there's nothing going on 
um, and I think I, I did that for years you know tried to you know gloss over everything and try to do my best but I was struggling and I think that's why it it almost ended the way that it did and I was completely not prepared for for the way that I had reacted um, to the stress and post-traumatic um, stress syndrome and then it continues on even after the fact even after you escape it continues on because that person is actually still in your life it's still part of your life especially when you have children and they can still continue the abuse after the fact that you've es escaped and that went on for about 10 more years for me and my and my daughter yeah that's a long time in 10 years yeah and um, there's just so much already and we've only been doing six questions. <laughs> I think we're doing good. What advice would you give to anyone listening that is scared or just putting up with family violence right now in lockdown? Yeah. You know, talk to people. Talk to people who you trust. You know, talk to people who... You know, sometimes, and, and I wish I had done this more during my, my um, time of going through this, was listening to my gut, listening to my heart, listening to my gut feeling, that intuition that we have. It's like, our, it's like a second sense, you know, um, that we have. And I think if I, had, if I had any sense, I would have listened to that sense. <laughs> Um, because that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that gut feeling that you have. Well, the first, you know, when you first wake up in the morning, and and what's going through your mind is, oh my god, you know, what am I gonna, what am I gonna, gonna deal with today? And then you start to make plans in your head, and you think, okay, I need to talk. I really feel like I need to talk to my friend Zoe or whoever it is that's close by the person that you trust the most you need to just talk about this thing you need to tell somebody you don't have to tell them everything you can just tell them that you need help that something is going on and there are things are not right in your situation and that you want to talk to somebody about it and I think talking at least starting to talk to somebody um, is really key to um, you know, to starting out finding yourself a solution and finding yourself a way out of the of the hellhole that you may be in right now. And um, and I think when I think about the recent issue with a friend of mine, um, she always tried to avoid. I think a lot of her friends did actually, um, you know, speak with her and um, we each in our own way kind of tried to make that connection so that we could deal with it um, and we were all looking at doing an intervention as well at one stage um, but I think that sometimes when you're so deep into it um, that you'll only probably end up talking to one person and not a whole bunch of people because you really don't want to tell a whole bunch of people because you're also shamed because you don't want everybody knowing your business but you always have that one person that you fully and you know trust to be there and and never stop praying mm. never stop praying because if I think if if I didn't pray that time whether you believe in God or not you don't have to be praying to God you could be praying to you know something to somebody to something um, to give you strength because sometimes you get superhuman strength to make decisions from that force you know whether that is God to you or it's you know some other kind of force but whatever you believe in whether you do yoga or meditation or whatever you have to believe in something because basically everything about you has been you know um, weakened and you know pushed down to its you know deepest darkest and you you feel like you have no hope but you have to 
talk to somebody whether it's God or whether it's to a friend you have to never stop praying and I think whether you believe in God or not God always listens God listens to you know believers and non-believers and you must be a believer if you ask praying if you do start to pray to God um, because if you yeah. say God's yeah. name you know um, and that's one thing that I never stopped doing I never stopped um, praying for a way out and sometimes you know in the worst moments when you are praying so hard and you say to God you know there were times when I said I said to God you're not hearing me or you're not answering my prayers why are you not answering me you know I was just like I feel like I have these arguments with God saying why why have you forsaken me and da 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 and all this and I feel completely good afterwards even though I you know it would be crap in the beginning but then afterwards you feel like you've just let all of this stuff go um to this god and mm. and and i i never stopped praying and and i know that god didn't always give me a yes with the things that i asked for you know there were many things and i i think i wrote something in the chapter of my book about that unanswered that that prayer that he said no to and it wasn't until 10 years later that I realized the reason why he said no to that prayer was so that he could say yes to this one today you know and God has his time and he gave me the strength to continue fighting um, during that other time only to make me realize why and I think if I knew then what I knew now, I wouldn't have been so aggressive because I had so much anger in me. Um, I was angry with my family. I was angry with my friends. I was angry with the law. Um, you know, I even went to court and represented myself as my own lawyer because I never trusted the lawyers that were dealt out to me who never wanted to help me. And, and, I trusted God in a lot of those and he said yes to many things but he also said no to other things um, or he didn't necessarily say no it was just like wait and then that reminds me of that verse in the Bible wait on the Lord and you know and all of that in short what I know now you know is incredible because I've come through all of that with such clarity now that I have today of the reasons why things happened the way that they did. It doesn't justify the fact that somebody was treating me in a violent and, um, you know, in a, in a terrible way that made me suffer. But it was necessary for me to go through the process in order to get out of all of that. And the processes that I've come through until now has brought me so much blessings and forgiveness, the power of forgiveness and also understanding forgiveness, understanding, knowing it and then being blessed by it, you know, and yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Well, it's very powerful. I can see that your tears and your heart and your experience and all the things that you've shared, uh, absolutely we pray that will encourage anyone that is remotely anywhere near, you know, um, suffering or unnecessarily, you know, that they, they do have the power to, to make a change. And if they're in a, like you say, if they're in a... Um, uh, a relationship or their partner or their they have children then yeah it is hearing your story really um brings it to mind again how important it is to make that decision so all the things that you said and and I love what you said about yeah never give up florist trust trusting in that one friend or that person yeah because by the time we get to act on something you know our trust has been eroded We've lost trust in, in a lot of people or 
So that's why it's so important to trust someone that you feel comfortable with, that's someone that is able to treat you in a way that you feel safe, um, that they have empathy and compassionate towards towards you, and, and also mostly that they're not going to judge you, that um, we're, we're sit, certainly not sitting here uh, saying that we know everything or I know everything about domestic violence. It's really from the lens and our own experience that we share today. And then secondly, yeah, like you say, is, is don't give up hope. There is hope. There's life. There's a better, um, and mostly that, you know, um, we both we both um, believe in God. And um, whether you believe in God or whether you're a spiritual person, um, but one of the verses that come to I love Jesus because he's an ultimate. Oh, um, and I love his his words in Matthew eleven, twenty eight. It says, "Come." Unto me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And there's no judgment there. I love how Jesus is. He's very, he just is. He just loves us no matter how, where or whatever the situation is, at what we're going through today. He knows he's the best person that can identify with trauma and shame and because he went through it all for us, that's how much he loves us, and that and that we are loved, that we are loved unconditionally, no matter what. So, um, and that's what we would love to share. And thank you, Floris, for sharing just the first tip of the iceberg experiences of your incredible story. That we get to both interview each other this way, and we get to um, yeah to really encourage other women or anyone that's out there. You could be a young person or you could be a bystander that has an inkling. I really, we really recommend that you follow up on the inkling or the sixth sense. If you know someone or is there a kid that everyone's written off and, and sometimes I always see when there's some, some when there's an angry person, they're angry for a reason. Um, nobody just wakes up in the morning and go, right, I'm going to be angry with everybody. Um, often there's something deeper going on. And so, yeah. So just before we wrap up our first series, it's been amazing. As you know, Floris, I could be, we could be talking for ages, which we did that last time. We went on for a couple of hours. That was just our warm up. <laughs> um, was there anything else that you'd like to share before we before we um, wrap up our first Talanoa? Yeah. Um, thanks, Marie. <laughs> you yeah, know, it has been a bit of a marathon, but. Um... I think what I really wanted to share, and it's it's one of the things, um, part of the, my story that I share um, with many people when I'm doing talks and that, and you know, all, there are so many things that we've gone through. I mean, I've lived 46 and you're 49, and our journey has been a long one, and we've just kind of picked the iceberg, you know, on top of the iceberg, we've, we've um, taken bits and pieces but I think what got me to here today that I'm sitting here and talking to you and and alive and well um, was the moment that I thought everything was hopeless and um, I had taken a trip I had given up on my entire life in New Zealand and I wanted a complete change because I had gone through not only the abuse and and obviously the the horrific relationship that I had, my marriage, and then subsequently losing custody of my daughter um, to my ex-partner, um, and you know just going through the system in New Zealand and just kind of having no trust and hope in anything um, that New Zealand had to offer me, and I had completely given up on Aotearoa <laughs> um, as far as my career and so on and I took myself to Samoa because I felt like I needed a fresh start um, but by the time I got to Samoa because it actually took me three years to finally get myself to Samoa to start the the you know a new life that I wanted to have there and by the time it was three years later and I had finally got there and standing in the plantation and in my village, my mother's village, I had actually had enough. 
I had come out of illness, I had come out of a near-death experience, I had come out of a second near-death experience um, through the um, car accident that I had in Samoa. And I thought that that was actually kind of the, the last thing, I, that that was it, I was finished. But of course I survived the car accident, but then I had to deal with so many things after that. But when I thought everything was completely hopeless and that I was going to end my life there in the plantation in Samoa, I took myself there and I thought, yep, this is a good place to do it and end it all here. And I looked up around me just in that moment. I just wanted to take one more look around me. And I just saw, and it felt like everything was in slow motion. I saw my parents' plantation. I saw the cocoa trees around me. And um, I saw just beautiful golden cocoa pods and the leaves kind of like flickering. And, and I felt just kind of this warmth um, sort of wrap around me um, from from these my surrounding the the plantation itself was kind of coming alive of course it's alive but I felt like it was coming even more like fantastically alive and and kind of wrapping itself around me and I felt like it was you know the support I remember that all of the support you know it came to that culmination of all the the support that I ever have needed in my entire life, whether it was my family, my friends, my colleagues, and my business, and and um, you know my church or or any community had I'd ever been involved in, I felt like the power of all of those things put together was kind of coming alive in this plantation and in, in nature surrounding me, and it was like wrapping itself around me. Um, and I felt just this wonderful kind of a warm blanket kind of settling on me and that was honestly that day I thought that was God's embrace you know that was you know something fantastic um, and people will who don't believe in God will believe in something else you know that that something some force of nature my ancestors everything the culmination of all the love that ever existed in my life kind of settled on me on that day and told me this is not your end this is your beginning you know and, and I had that epiphany on that day and that's why I decided that from that day I was going to be a farmer and I was going to be an organic one and that I was going to do something and never did I ever think that I would be able to tell this amazing story to people of all from all walks of life and be able to talk about God and coming out of all of those nasty experiences before. I never thought that I would be able to do that. And I realized that when I started making videos about what I had gone through and, you know, um, my uh, journey as an entrepreneur in cocoa and, um, you know, sharing with people my life as a cocoa farmer, as an organic farmer and so on. Um, I was actually at the same time sharing my deepest connection or reconnection back to the land included my connection back to God and and that's that's why I think this is really important that we do this because God shows himself or herself or itself to us in many different ways and and to me it was shown to me in nature through nature and that's that's love that's God's love and and however you take that i i i use that now as as my gauge as my not having any more of those you know nasty triggers of of the angst and and anxiety um and whatnot about the things that happened to me those things happen to me but they don't define me they don't define who i am as as a person who has been renewed by god and, and, and that's why I love the idea, thank you uh, Marie, for, for doing this podcast because it really does um, speak to how our journey can be trans, uh, transformative um, and be completely, um, you, you will rediscover who you are and what your true purpose and meaning is 
um, if you allow yourself to come through, to come past that, um, you know, that, that adversity that you're going through with, with family violence. And, and it changes the way that you also see everybody that you related to um, throughout your experience of family violence, excuse me. So that's, that's my story and that I just wanted to, to share that and how it's transformed my life. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Floris, for being my fearless first guest on Hear Us Now. If Floris's story has raised issues and you are in danger, please call 111. And if it's unsafe for you to speak, press 55. If you need to talk to someone, please reach out. See the show notes for the links. To find out more about Floris's Miss Sunshine Organic Farms, including their beautiful calendars and swag, the Samoa Women's Association of Growers, see the show notes for the links. If you know of anyone who will benefit from hearing this podcast, please subscribe, like and share to hear us now to stay up to date when we publish our next episode. You will find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Facebook, TikTok and Instagram and you can always reach us at hearusnowpodcast.com. Caring is everyone's business. Thank you for watching. See you next time.